Now, our next guest is a veteran journalist with a career of scoops and award-winning reporting. Leslie Stahl has been a central part of CBS 60 Minutes for nearly three decades, and she got the first interview with Donald Trump after he won the 2016 election, which made headlines around the world. She tells our Walter Isaacson what Trump told her then about his strategy to attack the press, the current impeachment hearings, and how the Watergate scandal changed her career and the course of American politics. Early on, very beginning of your career, you're really young, and you get put on this third-rate burglary in Washington. You're covering the Watergate burglary. First, tell me about that. I was brand new, the youngest. I don't mean the youngest by age, but the newest. I was really green in the CBS News Washington Bureau. And there's this break-in. What everybody seems to forget is the break-in took place in the middle of the 1972 presidential campaign. And it was similar. There were a lot of Democrats running in the primaries, just like now. So our bureau was empty. All these correspondents were assigned to one Democrat or another. So they sent me to the break-in because it was nothing. So let's send the new girl. She doesn't know anything, but that's okay, because this is a nothing, a nothing burger, yeah. uh, a local B&E. But it was a Democratic headquarters, so I went. And Bob Woodward tells you at the hearing or something, hey, stay with the story, kid. First, the arraignment. Yeah. The arraignment of the burglars. Yeah. But what they've had with them were these uh, $100 bills in consecutive numbers yeah. and weird passports, kind of phony passports. And Woodward looked at me. And we had just met. And we were the only two reporters in the, in the courtroom. Yeah. That's how insignificant you Washington and Bob thought. Woodward, the two junior people. Yes. And he said, you know, don't let them take the story away from you. On so now one. compare it, what you learned from Watergate, compare it to what we're going through now. There's a lot of similarities to me. And the main one is that the Republicans really did stick with Nixon up until the end. It's so similar. And I'm watching the Republicans defend him and attack uh, the witnesses, and I'm seeing Watergate with... I'm seeing the Watergate committee, the Senate committee. The Republicans stuck with him, including Howard Baker. You know, he said, when did he know? What did he know? What did the president know? When did he know it? But mainly, we found out later, his counsel, Fred Thompson, was getting questions from the White House. Mm -hmm. And so people have a mis... A memory, a mismemory of what happened back then. The idea that we are different in our tribes, mm -hmm. we're not different. If you're, if you're a Republican and you voted for that president, you're for that president. It happened with Clinton. Mm -hmm. The Democrats stuck with him till the end. So I'm a little into deja vu. But tell me what caused the Republicans back then to finally break from Nixon. It wasn't till the tape. The Supreme Court rule that Nixon had to turn over the transcripts of the tapes and the tapes themselves. And there it was. He, he was in on the cover-up from day one, using the CIA to uh, suppress the FBI, FBI from investigating. It was all spelled out in the transcripts. There was no escape. Mm -hmm. And senior Republicans from the Senate went broke, they broke, and went to Nixon and said, the Republicans will not be with you if there's a trial. And that was the end. And the end really wasn't even a vote. The end was Nixon saying, OK, the game's up. So we have a transcript now of the phone calls. Do you think times have changed, or do you think that that might cause some Republicans to break eventually? You know, I can't say the Republicans will never break. You know, these things are cumulative. Watergate took years to unfold, mm -hmm. years. Those hearings were weeks and weeks and, you know, those Watergate hearings were something like 15 weeks. Uh, we've had one week so far. So mm -hmm. you just don't know what the accumulation is going to do. Of course, it doesn't look like the Republicans are going to break. Did they what? break? Did the public start breaking against Nixon and then the uh, Republicans in the Senate followed the public? Is that what has to happen first? You mean in Watergate? No. Yeah. What happened was the tape. You know, the big, big, big difference is media. That's the big, big difference. In those days, there were only three networks. Every day, 
the public was hearing the same analysis, mm -hmm. hearing the hearings, but hearing the same analysis. We were still operating under the fairness doctrine. There was no p opinion way off to the right or way off to the left. It was really as much as these people could handle, the anchor people, down the middle. Today, you know, you go to your corner, you go into your little tribe area, mm -hmm. and you listen to who you want to listen to. Um, the divisions are much, much starker. There isn't a middle anymore, anyway, to sway. So if you look at what's going on right now, uh, people are seeing really what they want to see. During your career, you've tried to always play it as a storyteller. Walter, I am just being told by a high lieutenant that the choice is Bush. They're all yelling Bush all around me. White House officials see a pattern of terrorism, which they believe may be an attempt to test the will of President Reagan and the American people. Leslie Stahl, CBS News, the White House. I'm just going to tell you the story. You figure it out. Do you avoid going on talking head shows like uh, the cable nightly new evening shows? I do very little. I do very little, but here I am. So it's well, kind of funny. Well, PBS. <laughs> PBS. Yeah. No, I do very little. MCNN. I don't go on panels. Yeah. And I was raised that way. So were you. We came into mm. this business, particularly if you were in television. And as I mentioned, there was a fairness doctrine. We were under regulation to show both sides. And that was how I grew up. That's in my blood, my DNA. And I want to stay that way, because on 60 Minutes, we do have an audience that believes us, and we try very hard to be old-fashioned in that way. You've actually interviewed Trump twice, three times. Is it true, General Mattis said to you, the reason for NATO and the reason for all these alliances is to prevent World War III? No, it's not true. For all for was 60 I minutes? Believe, all for like 60 minutes. So tell me what that was like and why he keeps coming back to be interviewed by you. I think he, he sees 60 minutes as fair, and he has said so to us. Uh, and, Bal, you know, we, we're not going to mm -hmm. discredit him. We're not going to embarrass him. We play it straight. And he believes we have credibility. So he does, at least he has in the past. We'll see about the future, but he has in the past felt that this was the place to go for big moments. So he came on uh, r right before or during the Republican convention, mm -hmm. um, and he came on right after uh, the election, and then we got the first interview when he was in the White House. President Trump is continually attacking the press. Tell me how much it's undermining the authority of the press and how worried you are about that. Well, Nixon, let's go back there for a minute, it was with humor. Nattering nabobs of neg negativism by Agnew, but it was with humor, and it it had an effect, but Watergate had a boomerang effect. Ah, the press was the hero. Woodward and Bernstein were the heroes, and we went into a sort of golden age where the public thought we were redeemed. Mm -hmm. um, Trump, it's a more insidious gnawing away by the repetition over and over and over, we're f fake and we're out to get him. And I just see he just did a rally the other day in which he said, those people behind the lines, rope lines. Yeah, enemies present. of the people. Enemies of the people. And it has been startlingly, distressingly effective. Effective. Mm -hmm. The public doesn't believe us anymore. And you asked him, why are you doing that? And he told you his motivation. When I did the first interview, before I did the interview, we went up to his uh, office to have a, a conversation beforehand. I guess I was being auditioned. Mm -hmm. And he told me then. And in that conversation, I said, you know, he had just won the nomination. He was about to win the nomination. And I said, you have to stop beating up on the press. It's getting tiring and boring. You do it all the time. And, you know, it's kind of unappealing, I said. And he said, I'll tell you why I do it. I do it so that when you say negative things about me, the public won't believe you. And I thought, wow, it's a, it's a strategy. It's thought out. He is going to diminish his critics. But do you think that the press, or should I say we in the press, play into it? 
that we caused this problem by actually being opinionated more than we used to be? Yes, I do. Um, it's turned out to have been a mistake to appear on all these, all the cable shows. Uh, I watch my colleagues uh, at the New York Times, the Washington Post, trying so hard to play it down the middle, but you're in the sea, you're in the soup. You're, in, you're, you're on Morning Joe or you're on mm -hmm. one of the Fox shows. Um, you don't even have to say anything. You're just in the environment. And so, yeah, it's hurt, it's hurt us. But he's hurt us much more. And it, it's, it's the repetition. It's the constant. Mm -hmm. And it's thought out. Tell me about your thoughts on this campaign we're entering. You know, I had this, I don't know if it's an epiphany. Maybe someone, maybe everybody's had it. But I look at the last many cycles and I see that the elite candidate never wins. Mm -hmm. If you go through the list, and I have a list somewhere here. You know, Clinton beat George Herbert Walker Bush. Clinton was the country boy, the country mouse. Uh, George W., who was born in Connecticut but played the Texan, beat Gore and Kerry. They were the elites. Mm -hmm. uh, Hillary was the elite. So I'm looking in this cast of Democrats who can out-country Trump. Is it countrified or is it resisting the elites that helps? It's both. I mean, it's, it's the idea of standing up to the smarties, the hoity-toities, mm -hmm. the Harvards, the first in his class at West Point. It's the defiance against that, the being able to say, we. We're just as good as you are. Mm -hmm. so, so the who candidate the, who carries that banner. And who carries that banner, do you think, amongst the Democrats? Bernie. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that... What about Biden? Uh, he, he's, he is Pennsylvania. He could, he could pull that off, I suppose. I wasn't thinking there. What about Mayor Pete Buttigieg? I don't know. Mm -hmm. He has all, he can speak about 25 languages and <laughs> <laughs> is so well educated. Right, right. So I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I'm thinking that you have to, you have to kind of get on Trump's playing field on that, in that sense, to peel off people in, who voted for him and are wavering. I don't know how many there are today, but. How did Donald Trump, from a gilded tower in midtown Manhattan, who calls himself a billionaire, become the tribune of people you're talking about? You know, he's, he, he has a talent for knowing what the public wants. He, he was a showman, don't forget, when he was on television. He told me that, that his base is not a base, it's a movement, and they have come to support him in an emotional way, and you can see it. But he knew that in the campaign. He knew he was building a movement, and he understands how to uh, keep them with him. And part of that movement to build it involves attacking not only the elites, but the press. Well, anybody who will criticize him, anybody who's going to try to uh, tear down his reputation. And do you think it's just showmanship, or do you think it's truly dangerous? Yeah. You know something, Walter? That's just the kind of question and answer that I don't want to get into. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. I shouldn't be in that, be trying to take sides. Mm -hmm. It's hard for a reporter to walk that line and, and to really, really, really want to be objective and not be political and not be opinionated. It's hard. And that's why a lot of us shouldn't put ourselves in this position that I'm in right now. When you went to 60 Minutes, it was a boys club. And you break in and you do well. But partly you do it by 
just becoming a member of the club, too, right? But they accepted me as a member of the club. Um, there, there had been criticism right before I got there that they uh, had been unfair to Meredith Vieira, who had been... There's all, there was one woman. She, she had been the woman, and that she uh, was a working mother, and that they had not been uh, accepting of that part of her life. And so there, there were articles written uh, that they had not been fair to her. And I was a working mother, and they were all determined that I was going to have an easy time, and they accepted me. I never had one issue with that. But then CBS does have issues after a while, like most places, with the whole Me Too thing. Yes. You ended up defending Jeff Fager, who had been the producer of 60 Minutes with you, saying, this has gone a bit too far. This, do you think that whole Me Too movement went a little too far for some people? I defended Jeff because I've, I know him, and I thought that the, that the charges of him being, uh, that him imposing himself in a physical, sexual way on women was not that person. Mm -hmm. um, there were other issues, but he was not uh, a Harvey Weinstein. You've had a lot of famous tense encounters, including Boris Yeltsin walking off the set with you. How do you handle it when something tense happens on the set? Uh, well, Boris Yeltsin did walk off, and there was no luring him back in. Mm -hmm. But the hope is that you, you can get him back in the chair. Mm -hmm. um, and Ross Perot, who ran for president in 92, mm -hmm. uh, stormed off. And we just sat there and got his people around and said, he has to come back, he has to come back, he has, and we got him back. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've, I've had a couple of heads of state storm out. You can't get them back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, want to know a secret about that? When they storm out, you say to yourself, I have a story. <laughs> <laughs> what story that you've done in retrospect disappoints you and you wish you had done differently? I have one. It was during, be, around the time of the Iraq War, and it had to do with weapons of mass destruction. And I listened to a defector. I'd been warned not to. We had him vetted by a former CIA fellow, and he said, no, no, he's the real thing. And we put him on 60 Minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and he told us about weapons of mass destruction in trucks that he had bought, Renault trucks that he personally had bought, roaming, that Saddam had roaming around the countryside, making biological weapons. And we put that on 60 Minutes, and not a word of it was true. So that is my biggest regret. And what's the story you're most proud of? Mm. That's a toughie. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I always love the one I did, you know, the last one or the, the most recent. Mm -hmm. I just did one about Sesame Street and the International Rescue Committee joining together to help young, young, young children who are, who are born and are being raised in refugee camps. Mm. You've done a lot of things like that with technology and kids, too. I remember you've done it even with iPads and other oh, things. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, the iPad one w was for children with autism. Right. You know what I'm interested in? I haven't done this yet, but I'd like to. What happens to those kids when they're 30? Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of services when they're 5 and 10 and even 13. Yeah. And they age out. Mm -hmm. I want to do that story. Thank you for being with us, Leslie. Great. Thanks. <laughs>